uh, there's still some people coming in, but let's start. The, the, let, let me welcome you to today's uh, talk um, in Andean Cultures and Histories, uh, which, as many of you know, is a working group uh, here at Northwestern located in the Center for International and Area Studies. This is, in fact, oh, my name is Jorge Coronado. I'm the co-director of the, of the ACH. This is, in fact, our last event um, uh, for the year. Uh, as I'm sure is the case with many of you, our, our events have been impacted by, uh, by the current crisis. So it's been especially uh, wonderful, and I'm, I'm very grateful to Jorge Marconi um, for coming uh, to, uh, to speak with us um, and for uh, kind of, you know, rounding out, right, um, uh, what, what has been, you know, despite everything, uh, a, a terrific year for sharing uh, research on, on the Andes and in our areas of, of research, of study. Um, I also want to just take a quick moment to thank the staff, uh, who's been terrific through all of this, and without whom we can't do in, any of this stuff. Um, and uh, I um, am going to just say that we are recording the session. However, uh, Jorge and I are pinged. I don't think any of you are uh, being recorded. That's my understanding. In the question and answer period afterwards, um, we're, uh, there's enough of us that we're going to use the chat function uh, to do uh, questions. Um, and I ask you to keep yourself muted uh, during, the, during the talk so we can avoid any feedback or anything, uh, or anything like that. Okay, so uh, let me introduce our, our guest. Uh, Jorge Marcone is professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the program in comparative literature, and in the environmental studies major at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. He is a member of the advisory board of the South American Resilience and Sustainability Institute in Uruguay. His current areas of interest are the environmental humanities, Amazonian literatures, and indigenous cultural production. As such, Marconi has been engaged in understanding the far-reaching implications of local and planetary environmental crises and conflicts for epistemology, ethics, hermeneutics, and aesthetics. There are two broad areas of research in his work. One focuses on the impact of popular and indigenous environmentalisms and current ecological thinking, including ecological approaches to Latin American and Spanish literary and cultural studies. A second area of work is devoted to the literature, film, and arts of Amazonia. Without a shadow of a doubt, and in those writings, he has demonstrated that the Amazon's literary and artistic traditions are particularly rich in creative expressions that reconsider the human experience and its identity in light of the question of humanity's interconnectedness with nature under colonization and modernization. His publications, which have appeared broadly in both English and Spanish, have explored topics such as the Spanish-American regional novel, the so-called Novela de la Selva, indigenous documentary film and environmentalisms, Mexican literature, Chicana literature, Jose Maria Arguedas, Pablo Neruda, Jose Milo Pacheco, among many others. He is without doubt one of the principal voices in ecological criticism in Latin American literary and cultural studies. Um, to this, I'll add just briefly uh, how, uh, how enlightening it is uh, to read Jorge, whether it be on Romulo Gallegos, on uh, Jose Estacio Rivera and La Voragine, right? On Cesar Calvo's wonderful uh, novel uh, about, uh, uh, about the Peruvian Amazon, uh, or Texas Complex and his canonical at this point, as Arguera says, El Sol de Arriba, El Sol de Abajo. You know, in putting together this talk, I've come to realize that uh, Jorge has a sort of cluster of us who eagerly await every article that he produces and who uh, uh, and then do a deep dive into them, right, to better understand our own areas of study. Um, today, he's going to speak uh, from uh, what I think is the second area of research, which uh, on, on the topic of Amazonian stories from the Far East or from the Anthropocene Center. Please join me in welcoming uh, Jorge Marconi. Thank you very much, Jorge, for such an exaggerated introduction. And thank you to everybody else for coming and maybe giving me a hand with the current project. What I'm going to start doing now is try to share the, my screen so you can get to see the, the PowerPoint.
Is it working? Yes. Okay. So the, this is what I'm going to present today is part of an essay that is addressed to the general public or to, or to high school teachers. And I'm going, even though I'm, the, the essay is going to be published in Spanish. So even though I do this in English, I'm going to pretend that, uh, let's see. Okay. Hey, Jorge? Yep. I think we just lost the sound there a little bit, just, just so you know. That better or yes, it, it cut off a bit, but yes, go ahead. Okay, so okay, so my task uh, is to write this essay on 20th century Amazonian fiction for the Historia de las Literaturas del Peru, Volume 5, which is devoted to 20th century Peruvian fiction. It's going to be published by La Casa de la Literatura in Peru. Uh, which has become sort of uh, not only the official building, but almost representative of the literary institution in Peru. Uh, the aim of the volume, and of course of my own article, is to try to reach school teachers, high school students, and in general anybody interested in Amazonian affairs, for, uh, with the purpose of trying to contribute to a more democratic understanding of the plurality of the nation, for illuminating contemporary Amazonian issues, and to be able to recommend, given the fact that Amazonian fiction is not well known in the, among the public in Peru, with what books these readers should start. And my job is also try to find out if I can come up with an overall narrative for Amazonian fiction in Peru. Some of you, I've seen some of you before I started, have seen a previous version of this talk. Uh, so you may be able to comment as well on the things that I have uh, progressed or moved forward since, since then. Is this a worthy task? Uh, Amazonian writers, indigenous or not, local or migrants, are almost inexistent in the Peruvian literary canon. There is uh, some sort of, of Amazonian literary scholarship that had studied this uh, in recent years, and they carry this grievance. Now, the scholars and writers as well, that they have been marginalized in Peruvian literature, either because they are severe structures of social inequity, racism, or cultural perspectives foreign to the processes of literature in Peru, they also accuse the literary establishment of, although maybe thinking about themselves in very critical terms regarding the system or the establishment, they, their practices are not up to their progressive or liberal statements regarding what the canon, the literary canon of Peru should be. And another interesting aspect of these scholars is that they call for the discussion, the open discussion of the definition of literature, but on the other, on the other hand, the term should not be disposable or never substitute. In, in, it, it is important to be recognized as literature. It is important to achieve that recognition as part of being accepted for, by the nation state. However, my suspicion is that this claim may not be enough for altering this pattern of indifference. I hope that the, my work will contribute to further dissemination of Amazonian literatures, but uh, the claim has been made in several occasions in the past, and I am not sure that it is working, but I am on the pessimist side. And I will try instead another approach that uh, is better expressed in the words of the Amazonian poet Percival Vela, who said in the original in Spanish, in conclusion, I can say that my fundamental creative option is to make the Amazon the center of the world, the center of events that are connected one way or another with that world. Even though I'm writing for Peruvian readers, surprisingly or maybe not, 
I think it will be important to get my readers to get more familiar with the Amazon, particularly with the Peruvian Amazon. Is distance a, pro a problem? This is an argument that has usually, many of you have probably heard before, that in relationship to Lima, the Amazon is too far away. In relationship to the Andes, the Amazon is too, too far away as well, and that this might have contributed to the exoticism about the region. Although you can always argue that it's not the distance that creates exoticism, it's exoticism that imagines a place as a far distance, as a far distant location. In any case, I think uh, this, is, this, this is no longer true. In, in modern times, a flight between Lima and Cusco takes an hour, a flight between Lima and Iquitos at the heart of the Peruvian Amazon takes an hour and a half. A road trip to Pucallpa is shorter than a road trip to Cusco. And we know that there are very high rates of migration and deforestation closer to the Andes. Almost the ring of fire of, of deforestation is also a sign of Andean migration into the Amazon. And there are these other projects for improving communications between the Amazon and the rest of, of the country. Although more than improving the communication of the Amazon with the rest of the country, these two projects, the Transnational Highway and the Amazon Watershed Waterways, are projects aimed at bringing the Amazon closer to China closer to the Pacific and to the Pacific markets. Uh, you can go, you can, you can take that road trip to Pucallpa, drive your 15 hours nonstop, but from there, in order to reach Iquitos, you have four to seven days on the river navigating. And not necessarily because it is distant, but because of the conditions of the river itself. So there are very significant projects going on in Peru for dragging the Marañón and the Ucayali and making the communication by river more fluid between Iquitos and the rest of the country. And regarding distances, if anything, maybe more important than how distant the Amazon is to Lima is the fact that the Amazon feels that Lima is too far away from them. That may be probably the issue of distance that may be more worth it to consider. Does size matter? In a way, apparently not. Uh, the Amazon is more than 60% of the country, of the national territory, and yet its literature and its, and its history has been marginalized. The Peruvian Amazon is 9% of the total rainforest cover in South America, second only to Brazil. In 2018, the Amazon, all the regions of the Amazon together, was 5% of the gross national product and 7.5% of the state expenditures, current or capital investments budgeted for that same year went to the Amazon, uh, to the Amazon regions. So there is a couple of, of, of assumptions that I want to pick up from here, thinking about how will I tell the story about Amazonian fiction. And the first one is that the sheer size of the rainforest in Peru should alert us that disfavoring or being suspicious of the study of representations of nature is a mistake here. L literary studies have this tendency, at least since, since the second half of the 20th century, of distrusting the study of the representation of nature as, as a way of avoiding talking about social issues or trying to hide other more important issues. And the other thing is that in terms of economics, the Amazon is really a small player in Peru's nation states, politics and economics, which may be interested in terms of if economics the form we carry development in the Amazon will change significantly. It won't affect significantly either the economy of the country. Who actually lives in the Amazon? According to the 2017 census, 13.8% of the Peruvian population lived in the Amazon, roughly 4 million inhabitants. 
it has been just a small increase in the last 10 years. So the total amount of population seems to me stable. However, out of those 4 million, 200,000 self-identify themselves for the census as indigenous people. And that is a dramatic decrease from 10 years ago where 333 people self-identify as indigenous people, divided in this amount of communities, family language, ethnic groups, and so on. However, these numbers are contested. The Principal Federation of Indigenous Peoples in the Amazon, Asociación Interétnica de Desarrollo de la Selva, y the CEP, claims that the indigenous population in the Peruvian Amazon goes up to 650,000 indigenous women and men. Just to put these numbers of the Amazon in a larger context, uh, especially within Peru, in Peru, 22% uh, of the population perceive themselves as Quechua. So even in the context of indigenous peoples in Peru, Amazon people are also a minority in, in the country. On the other hand, in Peru, 60% of the population identifies or perceives themselves as mestizos. And one of the interesting things is that other than Madre de Dios, which is one of the Amazonian regions, all other Amazonian regions are at the top of this category. In other words, the region where most people consider themselves to be mestizos and not indigenous in all the 25 regions of the country is the Amazonian region of San Martin. Loreto is number three, Ucayali is number six, and the region of Amazonas number nine out of 25. There is, and the reason this is happening is because there is a significant migration of Andean peoples to the Amazon. On the other hand, there is no significant indigenous migration from the Amazon to the coastal cities, in spite of the fact that there is a Shipibo Conibo migration into Lima of about 15,000 that has been involved in terrible stories of discrimination in the city of Lima but there is no significant migration of indigenous Amazonians into the coastal cities, at least measured by numbers. I wanted also to bring up this, these other statistics about water. 73% of Amazonians, indigenous or not, for whom the main source of water is rivers, irrigation dishes, natural springs, creeks, and so forth which I think is the best way of understanding why issues of contamination and pollution are, it's a fundamental issue for, uh, for Amazonian cities and for Amazonian communities overall. And two more assumptions moving forward towards what kind of implications I can draw from this information as I develop my own story about Amazonian fictions. The Amazon is overwhelmingly mestizo in a multi ethnic in its place. And it's very important to keep this in mind because without the participation of the mestizo community, there won't be, there will not be mitigation of deforestation in Peru. On the other hand, privileging the indigenous is not wrong, but given these numbers, it cannot go unexamined, our tendency to privilege indigenous identity for the Amazon. And the second observation, is that the lack of a significant Amazonian presence in the city, if we connected that to a history of marginalization of Amazonian literary, uh, Amazonian fiction from the canon, reveals that the literary histories are written by actors in Lima, whether they are Limeños or whether they are migrant subjects. Uh, but the journey into the canon seems to go through immigration to Lima. And then, of course, we have the environmental, the environmentalist pressure. I'm not going to go over the four points that are related to the Amazon as an ecosystem. Some of them are familiar, uh, are the best known issues about the Amazon. I want to talk about Peru's emissions of carbon dioxide. In 2018, 
2018, the carbon emissions from Peru were 50, 57 million tons. If you want to get a sense how much is that, it's 1% of the U.S. emissions for the year of 2013 and 0.14% of the world emissions for 2019. So it's really, in terms of numbers, it doesn't look as much. However, out of that amount, in 2014, which was the year where the COP took place in Peru, uh, more than 60% of Peru carbon emissions were due to deforestation. It's not only the amount of carbon dioxide that Peru releases because of deforestation, is the amount of carbon dioxide that Peru can put back into the atmosphere if deforestation continues. Nearly 7 billion metric tons of carbon stocks, mostly in the Amazon Great Forest. How much is that? It's about 17% worth of the annual emissions of 20, the global annual emissions for 2019. So it's not only what it is being released in deforestation, it's not only what we have to keep on the ground, but it is also that if burned, if the forest burned, what is the carbon dioxide that the Amazon will not be sequestering or absorbing from the atmosphere? And roughly, although I have to check these numbers, roughly uh, in a year, Peru's forests are able to absorb 50 million of tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So if the single most important contribution that Peruvians can make to climate change is preventing further deforestation of the Amazon. Let me try and two different hypotheses that explain why Peruvian Amazonian fiction has been neglected for, for throughout the 20th century. The first one is the following. The Amazon has not been part of any historical event that has threatened the existence of the Peruvian nation state. In, in Peru's intellectual history, the exploration, the study of the Andes, the study of indigenous people from the Andes is closely related to a sense of crisis that started with the war with Chile at the end of the 19th century and that has spread throughout the 20th century. Jorge can can speak certainly more about, about this. So our interest in the Andes, it's related to a sense that overlooking the Andes and its population will be a significant, significant mistake because things can happen there or things from there can come down to the coast in ways that the nation state will be threatened. In Peru, the Amazon stops at the Andes. Deforestation may alter dramatically the planet's biosphere, but the sensation in Peru, the feeling and sensation will be that the nation state will survive in spite of that deforestation. There are some significant crises that have taken place in the Peruvian Amazon, but I don't think that any of these have been considered as crises that threatened significantly the Peruvian state. So there is no urgency. There is a need to study the Amazon, but from the perspective of the nation state, there is no urgency for, for this. Not even because of drug trafficking, not even because the Amazon has been uh, the main site of production of, of drugs in Peru, and certainly not due to the pandemic. I'm not going to indulge. Uh, when I was doing this, I went and checked some, some numbers. And the terrible news, uh, although maybe you are aware of it, is that the, all the Amazon regions together are second in infection and death toll, uh, only second to, to Lima. But there is one event in the history of the Amazon that might have been an event in which the nation state felt threatened. And that was the Baguazo the of 1909. Now we'll come back to this historical event. For the time being, and drawing towards my, my project, I made a note to myself 
that mainstream or leading intellectuals have not drawn from the Amazon any symbolic capital for the discussion of identity, of Peruvian identity. It is important, of course, for Peruvian citizens of the Amazon, but in general, the Amazon is treated just as a regional specialization. What is it with the Amazon then? What, 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 what is going on in the Amazon that leads to this uh, discrimination other than structural reasons about discrimination in Peru? My argument is that the Amazon, the Peruvian Amazon, is a frontier that has failed consistently the nation state. For a nation state run by the right or for a nation state run by the new left, which is not exactly the case in Peru, but the new left that has governed in Ecuador and Bolivia has also been disappointed and frustrated by the fact that the Amazon has not become this frontier with capital S. In the intellectual history of Peru, Victor Andres Veraonde in the 20s and Raul Porras Barnechea in the 1940s thought about the Amazon as a frontier for the nation state. Two different visions, but with one thing in common. Like every frontier, the frontiers will be able and helpful to reject to regenerate the country. I am sure that you are all familiar of the many versions of the myth of El Dorado that have taken place in the Amazon, or I, I, I understand I generalized the myth of El Dorado as the myth for a fast and highly profitable enrichment. Oil exploitation, rubber, drugs, palm trees, any, any form of extractivist industry. The Amazon seems to have the ability to resist stubbornly whatever understanding of modernization is pursued in its territory. Ways of modernization, ways of extractivism have not sustained economic growth. Many of their actors indulge in the region's remoteness from the state because of a variety and even contradictory reasons. There are social actors in the Amazon that prefer to stay away from the Peruvian state. There is a long history of resistance of indigenous and local communities to extractivism, big or small, big international transnational corporations or small extractivism. The second one is almost uh, as terrible or not or worse than the first one, as the gold mining rush in Madre de Dios constantly reminds us. And it's always the source of these exotic but annoying claims of animism of non-human beings. So the nation state is frustrated with the Amazon. Amazonian beings, humans or non-humans, hold the country back. And this is probably well illustrated in the reaction of the late President Alan Garcia that led to the violence and the conflict of El Baguazo from 1909. I'll get to El, to El Baguazo. But all this frustration with uh, a history of not being up to the challenge, and I think also the awareness that the Amazon as a frontier, in a way, is gone. So let me delve a little bit into this. Under the title of what happened to whom or doom after the greenhouse. Those of you who have read the greenhouse may remember this Awahun character in Mario Vargas Llosa's novel. It is a character that has popped up again in the storyteller, in El Hablador, and in, 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 other, uh, in, a, in other writings by Vargas Llosa. And it's usually, it's, it's, it's seen as the case study that supports the overall Vargas Llosa argument about how to improve things in the Amazon, which is not with less modernization, but with more modernization or by true modernization, not by medieval structures that claim to be civilized in the Amazon, but what it is needed is more modernization, not less modernization. Whom is this Awahun character that tries to organize his community for selling rubber directly to the market with, without the intermediaries that are exploiting them, but the intermediaries in turn um, attack him, uh, torture him, and he loses his position within the community, 
and ends up being an accomplice of the worst terrible character in, in Vargas Llosa, the greenhouse, the infamous Fuchia, and by that, uh, becoming himself a stealer of rubber from other indigenous, indigenous communities. Curiously enough, around the 1960s as well as when the greenhouse was published, it is about the time when the Awahun and the Wampis that actually appear in Vargas Llosa's novel in the 60s, Awahuns, Wampis, and later Ashanikans and, Am and Amorishas started organizing in indigenous federation. One federation after another federation, up to the point of becoming the IDESEP, this interethnic association that I was mentioning before that claims that the overall number of indigenous people in the Amazon is about three times the amount reported in the census. So the direction, my point here is the direction and strengths of indigenous people resilience have surprised every form of expectation. Even if you want to claim that this sort of social organization and organization is in itself maybe a story of assimilation, or maybe not. The IDESEP defines its main purposes as an association devoted to the defense of collective rights over territory, self-governance, control of indigenous economy, foster interculturalism, and improvement of health and overall well-being. So let me let me offer you a little bit background about land tenure in, in the Peruvian Amazon, which is different from other Amazonian countries and may help explain. And I'm actually here setting, setting the background for going back to ba El Baguazo, that episode on 1909 that I think has been crucial and fundamental. Uh, and that marks uh, uh, after and a before in Amazonian history and and probably on why we are paying more attention to Amazonian fiction nowadays. In Peruvian laws, Peruvian laws since early the 20th century has promoted colonization by means of agriculture and private development. The assumption has always been that forest, that the forest has less economic value when compared to using the, the land and the territory for agriculture or for other extractive ventures. Property rights are only granted if the land is going to be used for agriculture. The state remains the ownership of the subsoil resources, but also the state keeps the uh, ownership of the forest about ground. The state grants concessions or also fraught rights for the use of these resources but without relinquishing ownership. And this is particularly important in understa for understanding how Andean colonial settlers, generation after generation, not all of them are devoted to agriculture, but some of them are usufructing this state's allotments of forest in order to make a living, but they cannot cut the forest. They have to find a way of making the forest profitable without cutting them down. And overall, 70% of the Peruvian Amazon is already covered by oil and gas concessions, overlapping with rights to communal territories and, of course, exacerbating territorial and social environmental. So this is the background for understanding what was El Baguazo. In 2008 and 2009, the government issued legisl legislative decrees for parceling and privatizing indigenous territories for fostering industrial uses of the territory. Protests followed in the Amazon that led to a violent and deadly confrontation of the police with indigenous and peasant protesters near the town of Bawa. By the way, Bawa is about a four hour drive from Santa Maria de Nieve where Vargas Llosa said the Amazonian part of his novel, La Casa Verde. As a consequence of that violent confrontation, the government had to give up and those decrees were derogated by Congress. And furthermore, a new prior consultation law was finally approved. Uh, Peru was a, is a signature of the uh, International Labor Organization and, and 
Convention 169, which guarantees indigenous rights since the early 1990s, but didn't develop a law of prior consultation after BAWA, after 2009. Now, what else happened after BAWA? And this is very, very important. Consultation and enactment of a new forest and wildlife which grants exclusive rights of indigenous communities to use forest resources in their territories. In two, by 2016, one th more than 1,300 Amazonian communities got titles for more than 12 million hectares of land. There are still 644, 644 more claims pending for an additional almost 6 million hectares. At the same time, almost 3 million hectares have been des designed as reserves to protect semi-nomadic groups, essentially indigenous people that live in isolation, in self-isolation or partial, partial isolation. And another 2 million hectares have been devoted as communal reserves that are being administered by communities of indigenous people, by federations of indigenous people. So since BAWA, what has happened is that about 33% of the forest, the Amazonian forest in Peru, is one way or another in some sort of control of 0.7% of Peru's population. Is this an isolated case? Many of you know that I've been tracing the stories of environmentalism, indigenous environmentalism in, in in, I want to start moving faster here in, in the Amazon. And you know that there is plenty of film documentaries that have been telling stories like the one I've just been telling today to you about indigenous environmentalism. All of them have certain things in common that I think also are part of the pressure that we have when trying to make sense of contemporary Amazonian fiction in terms of contemporary affairs, we are also under pressure by with the films are already telling. What kind of stories they are telling? They are telling stories of self-governing, even autonomy. They are telling stories in which they reject the objectification of indigenous people but reject as well the objectification of non-human beings and landscapes. They tell stories about networking and alliances, networking and alliances among indigenous people and networking and alliances with transnational actors. These stories are making claims about political ontologies. These are more than human communities in, in, in identities. Indigenous identities are more than ethnic identities because they are self-perceived as belonging to more than human uh, communities. They speak about the Amazon in terms of some sort of social, environmental, spiritual network of humans, indigenous or not, and non-humans. Ontological, ontologically, the Amazon thinks of itself something very different than a territory or something very different than a forest. These are films produced, directed, or acted by indigenous individuals, sponsored by local communities, even financed by indigenous organizations. And it has become a very interesting phenomenon in, the, in, in which Visual, visual media has, is becoming apparently the preferred story, the preferred medium for telling stories of the invisible Amazonia. In Amazonian cosmologies, everything that it is really happening in, in the Amazon happens at an, at an invisible level that can only be accessed through shamans or through uh, uh, the use of drugs such as ayahuasca. So here is what I was trying to argue with the title. How can we have gone from the Far East uh, and El Oriente, right? Like in Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador, and in Colombia, the Amazon in the 19th century was called the Oriente, the Far East, to the Anthropocene frontier. Not only in the sense that extractivism is the avant-garde of capitalism under the Intractism, the Anthropocene, but also in the sense 
that the Anthropocene is a moment of frustration in a moment of, of fear. The, the, the Amazon as a nation state frontier is heavily contested and we know that it should come to an end. On the other hand, this awareness is also the side of frustration and of fear with what comes after the practical implications that come after this awareness. There is no successful conquest of nature. There are environmental limits to economic development. The Amazon is a place of transnational concerns that challenges the sovereignty of the nation state. It bridges the gap between the humans and non-humans. Identities are more than human. It's the annoying reminder of the need to rethink progress, public wealth and well-being. And is the site in, in, the, in the risk of waves after wave of claims of territorial autonomy by indigenous uh, people. So I nearing, actually I'm entering into the last part of, of the talk here. Uh, I don't know if it is uh, evident or not, but then I took the time and tried to gather from all this contextualization of the Peruvian Amazon and the kind of knowledge that Peruvian citizens know to have, need to know about their own uh, uh, Amazonian region, what kind of implications or assumptions of gold should I keep in mind when performing the history of Amazonian, of Amazonian fiction? In what ways this can be relevant to all the above? So we can bring attention to Amazonian fiction other than the claim that it is being marginalized because of the literary establishment. Can it be useful for recognizing and understanding the actors and the stakeholders involved in Amazonian political conflicts? Can it be useful for understanding the dissolution of the frustration with the correctness and viability of the frontier? Can it be helpful for understanding that the Peruvian Amazon is a place of centrifugal forces away from the nation state? Can it be useful for understanding that local and transnational circumstances are calling for innovating the governance of the Amazon? Can it help us for understand the, the issue of alliances and networks that are always complex, are always complicated, but apparently very much necessary? Does literature reflects, had been reflected unknowingly this Amazonia at large concept that I mentioned before. Can it help us understand whether we call it ecology or not? Can we help us understand the independence or implication of human beings, modern or not, and of the things they do and create with natural beings, with events and with processes? Is this a literary tradition that tells stories of affective and non-symbolic communication with non-humans? Do they show that animism is not residual romanticism or a pre-modern component? In the last two, will these fictions entertain the notion that as representations of the Amazon, they are more than cultural events produced by human subjects, but part of a change of communication with non-human agential beings, and yet still make the case for verbal narrative under the pressure of film and the visual arts. What is the scholarship telling us? What is Amazonian literary scholarship telling us, at least telling me before I jump into reading uh, all this literary tradition? Uh, I want first to recognize above anything, the work that Manuel Marti Corena Quintanilla and Ricardo Viruez Villafane have done already for gathering almost in many different publications an encyclopedic account of Amazonian literary history. We have uh, not all the primary sources listed, but we have a lot of the primary sources already identified this is a scholarship that is dealing with the marginalization like a grassroots movement. Amazonian literary scholarship behaves like a grass, 
grassroots movement that is collecting titles, recognizing authors, publishes and disseminates books, celebrates events in the hope of effecting change at the national level. Following established literary theories, this is a scholarship that rigorously distinguishes mestizo, indigenous, and Hispanic literatures because of language differences. However, on the other hand, and in very Amazonian fashion, it brings them together or lets them come together without privileging one or the other as more authentic. And finally, above all, I find, I've been finding that in these panoramic views of Amazonian fictions, we can, fly, we can find some larger and persistent themes that match my expectation above. We, might, we will find in Amazonian fiction stories about political ecology of capitalist activities, but also stories about the political ecology of alternative practices to that capitalist exploitation. We will find a literature that obsessively has reached out to indigenous epistemologies and ontologies through their oral narrative, recovering oral narrative, translating, rewriting, uh, transcribing oral narrative is, is fundamental in this literary tradition. It is indeed a literature that gives witness to the actancy of the forest, the river, and other beings mediated or not by indigenous cosmologists. It's not only people following indigenous cosmologies, the one that perceive the animism of the forest. It's a literature where the relationship of text to the territory and the relationship of text to dreams is very idiosyncratic. It's a literature that tells an urban experience, the urban experience of the Amazon, Particularly, at least at the late 20th century, Amazonian cities were the fastest growing cities in South America. So we are, we are talking about a different form of urbanization uh, as well. And it's a literature heavily committed to the practicing of the writing of children's literature. Often in connection with purposes of intercultural education, and for environmental education about the forest. My next stop would have been, my next time will be rereading Las Tres Mitades de Inomoxo, Three Halves of Inomoxo, The Teachings of the Wizard of the Upper Amazon in the 1995 translation into English. But that, I'm afraid, will have to be left for another occasion. Thank you very much for your patience. And uh, thank you, Jorge, uh, for the talk. I think uh, I'll do this for everyone. At the end, I can unmute everybody um, and, uh, and we can hear actual applause. Um, so uh, like, like I said, the ideas that we will have, there's uh, 44 participants right now, so I think that's difficult to handle with uh, verbal. So if you have a question, please uh, take a moment to put it into the chat box and we will be um, queuing, queuing those up. Um, and, and to get us started, Jorge, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to, uh, to ask a question, because I have many of them uh, here. Um, one thing that occurs to me is a very kind of basic, uh, kind of nuts and bolts question, which is, you're, you're describing, right, um, at, at some moments you're talking about kind of literary production, and I understand you, uh, you're demonstrating an investment in um, uh, in continuing to think about the literary, which I'm delighted to see, um, but you're also talking about far-flung and and very large, uh, you know, traditions with very different sorts of um, uh, uh, presentations in uh, media, be it film, right, be it video, be it uh, perhaps visual arts, right, oral narrative. Um, so the, the the question first is where where are these archives like where where are you seeing right or or where, where can we find right if we had a, a graduate student who was interested in doing this sort of deep dive where would you recommend uh him going to that's the nuts and bolts question i'll come back to other questions later and, and i'll start looking at uh, what's coming in in terms of, of archives in terms of literature and in terms of film as well right 
Yeah, and I'm also, but, but I'm interested in this proposition because I think it's here that actually the archive is much broader. You seem also to be talking about oral narrative, right? Uh, indigenous uh, worldviews, cosmovisiones, right? Wh where's the archive for that? And, and uh, you know, importantly, like, where can we find it? What, what's, what are the access points to it? I understand that for 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 literature is is difficult. I don't know exactly where the collections are. Uh, in in between what archives, but I understand that that is precisely why the main task of the scholarship on Amazonian literature has been so much devoted in collecting the titles and in, in, in the authors. Um, Marti Corena has spent almost all his life putting together all this. Now, uh, I don't know yet. I don't know. I don't have the exact response as to where the archives are, but we have the secondary bibliography through which uh, graduate students interested in pursuing this will be able to start identifying uh, uh, where the sources are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The films are... are the films are in the internet. They, they are not difficult. They are not difficult to find, especially because they are designed to circulate, right? To, to, they are not only for the consumption of one community, one indigenous community. They are there for being shared with other, with other, with other communities. And just to complicate more your question for me is that it's not only film; it's also painting. It's also the visual arts that is becoming. A main, uh, a main protagonist here. But also, uh, what I didn't mention, because in the work for the Historia de la Literatura, the project has divided up the work. There is written indigenous literature also from the Amazon in Spanish or in indigenous, in indigenous language. And I didn't went in, into that because, the, but this is something that has been researched already and there is secondary bibliography about about it and it's probably easier to find the compilations and recollections of oral narrative that some of the novels that were published in the 1920s and 30s and since they were forgotten and they have not been republished again and they are more difficult to find yeah i mean i think you know just to go back to my appreciation of your work one of the wonderful things is you know uh uh you know, your, your suggestion that we read novels like La Voragine and Canaima, perhaps, right? And, and others from the 1920s and 30s as a sort of, you know, waking, waking to an ecological, right, view, right, of, uh, of what's been happening in the Amazon, as we all know, for a very long time. We have questions coming in, so I'm going to shift to those. Uh, can you see them, uh, Jorge? Yes. Great. So let me just read Tara Day's. Is it possible to consider Amazonian literatures within the confines of Peru, or is it always a regional literature exceeding the confines of any nation? Can you, Jorge, elaborate on national versus regional approaches to the Amazon, and if you work beyond Peru, and how and why? Uh, uh, beyond Peru, yes and no. Uh, I, I agree with, with, the first, with the first question. Uh, n not only the issue of the Amazon and the fires that are coming uh, and the fires that happened before uh, poses a, a very fundamental question, a very tough question about the governance of the Amazon and that it has to be regional in the sense of transnational. And it is true that in terms of literature, uh, it's more of a pan-Amazonic than national Amazonians is the Amazon is also a transnational space and it's more pan-Amazonic. Amazonian writers of one country are very much aware of what other Amazonian writers in other countries have been writing and reading throughout the 20th, throughout the 20th century. And above all, oral tradition precisely uh, illustrates this, and, and, and particularly mestizo oral tradition, illustrates very well how the circulation of stories, written or oral, indigenous or not, have circulated uh, uh, way uh, 
beyond borders. So it is, it is, uh, it's not only right, probably the fundamental way uh, would be to think about it in terms of region in the sense of a transnational, a transnational and, and, and that might be in fact the future of it. But I am allowing myself these days because of the task that I have in front of me to revise the Peruvian Amazon from the perspective of the nation state. And not only because I'm yielding to the task that I have accepted, but because I don't see, uh, we cannot do without the state even if we go into transnational governments of the Amazon, it will be states signing, signing this. And the urgency of how soon things need to be done uh, requires that we have to work with the state. We cannot wait until we bring down this state and come up with a new, with a new state. Uh, so in a way I'm, being more localized nowadays, it's, it's just a matter of, of timing. But initially, actually, I started reading the novelas de la selva across, across countries and finding common trends in them. But Tara, I Thank you, Jorge. Um, let me read a question from uh, uh, Lis Baron Carvajal. I have two questions. Uh, one, I understand this project centers on Peru, and I don't know anything about Amazonian literature in general, but there are examples in other Latin American countries in which Amazonian literature is not marginalized, maybe celebrated or recognized or something else. Or is this a problem of Amazonian literature in general? That's the first. Two, have you or other scholars of Amazonian literature uh, considered the dangers inherent in your task of making this literature more well known perhaps exoticization or something of the sort? Yes. Um, I think there are other countries in which Amazonian literary texts have made it to the national literary canon of those countries. So in that sense, it is different. The case of Peru is, is different. Canaima, uh, just to mention one for Venezuela, La Voragine for Colombia, and Brazilian literature. Uh, and in Brazil, there is, there is uh, fundamental writers that come from the Amazon, but there is a different relationship. That, that's, that's why uh, I opened the possibility that it will be worthy to approach the Amazon from a transnational perspective, but also from the Andes, looking at it from the Andes, because it tells, it tells a, different, a different story. And uh, so it, there are countries in which it's more celebrated and recognized. Uh, there are also countries in which the density, the population density is higher in the Amazon. So that also, with that comes all the changes about rec recognition and implication. Um, there is another interesting thing that I wanted to say. I, I wanted also another reason I, I wanted to stay within an, a nation for a while was to understand the laws that govern the use of the territory. And I think that's very important. If we are aware of this, we'll be able even to do better interpretations of the plots of the stories that we have in, in hand. And the laws that govern the use of territory in Peru and then the use of the forest are different to uh, different countries and enriched by this perspective, we may be able to do different readings of, of this fiction. And, and uh, yes, consider the dangers of asking this term, literature well known, perhaps exotization, something of the sort. Uh, yes. Uh, but I am betting on the fact that the conversation about these novels. Uh, my hypothesis is that in all these novels, what creates the plot, what creates the conflict in the, in the, in the narrative is that any form of experiment of modernity in the Amazon, mainstream or alternative, fails because it has not been taken into account the agency of the non-human. 
And instead of forgetting these novels, I think it will be more useful to bring them back to the conversation. Because in a way, all ecological thinking starts with a dissolution. Starts with a dissolution with modernity, with realizing the limits of, of modernity. So I, identifying the moments of dissolution is that's where the ecological moment starts. Mm. Okay, I think Jimena uh, Liseño, uh, who's got the next question, kind of links up with, with what you're saying right now. Um, uh, she says, on the literature under pressure of the visual, in terms of literary historiography, we are used to equating subjectivity with perspective. Could you please speak more about this? Are you suggesting that the history of the Am of Amazonian literature is only possible from an Amerindian perspectivism as it may be represented in visual arts and film? I am suggesting the possibility that Amerindian perspectivism it's in the Amazon is, uh, is not restricted only to Amerindian subjects. The history in, in part because the history of the Amazon is the history of this mestizaje. The, 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 during the rubber boom, there was so much contact. And it's not just a matter of ecotourism. Shamans do not restrict to ethnicity to whom they are going to pay attention or, or help to, to heal. Um, Amazonian stories are there for being told to everybody, not only for being told for the, for the community. And my argument, my hypothesis would be that Amerindian perspectivism in the, in, the, in the Amazon, it's by now probably more Amazonian, or at least in the Andean sites, more Amazonian than just Amerindian. And that uh, it's not only the agency it's not only the dissemination of Amerindian perspectivism, is the agency of the forest, is the agency of the forest itself as well. Thank you, Jorge. Um, Ryan Pinchot uh, asks, you talked about cinema as a primary mode of envisioning the invisible Amazon. What are the comparative strengths or weaknesses of cinema compared with the written word when representing the networks that compose the Amazon, or maybe otherwise said, what can Tres Mitades de No Mucho uh, do or say that El Abrazo de la Serpiente cannot, and vice versa? <laughs> the the second part is precisely <laughs> why we need to go back to, uh, to make the case for, for, for literature, but going first back to the first time, to, to the first one. Uh, so what we, what I think we know is the preference for film. Uh, in, in, for indigenous communities themselves, film is becoming the preferred medium. And I don't think it's only because of the convenience of, 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 of film as a mean of communication or the advantages as a mean of communication among populations that are still highly illiterate, even in their own, in their own languages. But I think that there is something there to explore, uh, something obvious to be explored, but with fresh eyes between the relationship, the importance of dreams in Amazonian and cosmology and the visuals of films. So the easy response is that films are like dreams, but we have been saying that for decades. So we have to Amazonify that, that statement. Uh, and and as to more details as to how the Tremitae the you know, Moxo will bring uh, what the Abrazo de Serpiente cannot, uh, that's the part of this last slide that we'll have to wait for the next opportunity. Thank you, Jorge. Um, Joseph Barton uh, asks a comparative question uh, a USA case, the South, uh, a Russian case, Siberia. I'll ask about the USA South a region blasted by war and extractive industries barely known in early 20th century U.S. literature, yet from the 1930s on at, at the center of U.S. literature. Key was rediscovery of body of testimony, the narratives of African-Americans escaping slavery. 
These narratives sparked the literary imaginations of W.E.B. Du Bois, Zora Neale Hurston, and Toni Morrison, to take just three. Is there a similar body of Peruvian testimony from people on the margin inventing a new form of writing, waiting for rediscovery? Most likely, yes. And maybe there is already this, there is already, this is already part of this other branch of indigenous literature written in Spanish or, in, or indigenous language. Uh, intercultural education programs are literacy programs. So uh, there is a good chance that uh, this is happening, especially uh, the, the history of the rubber boom. But it is also true that in, in, in uh, not to over, overlook the importance of writing, but uh, to, to bring further attention to this comment is that it's the narration of the slavery during the rubber boom that it's one of the main themes in Amazonian painting. Mm -hmm. So probably the sources are already there. And, and, and if not, I'm, I'm sure that they are being developed uh, through intercultural education. Indigenous communities, the IDESEP has a college, has a, has a, a college for educating indigenous people in their own traditions, but also in educating them on how they want to reach out to the Western and modern world. It's a college that is outside Iquitos, is called Forma Viap. And so I'm sure that this is being uh, done if only as part of curricular development. Thank you, Jorge. And um, Berenice Mendoza asks, um, what can you say is one of the most significant challenges facing the Permian Amazon and how can we contribute to the solution? That's, that's a large one. Uh, deforestation. Yeah. There you go. And supporting indigenous people will be, will be the best uh, way of contributing to that solution. Succinct and to the point. Uh, Juan Ramos asks, in your description of how the Peruvian Amazon has been framed and understood, you briefly mentioned the conflict with Chile. How does the historiography of territorial dispute over Amazonian territories among Peru, Brazil, Colombia, and Ecuador from the 19th century into the 20th century fit into your understanding of the Peruvian state's historical investment in the Amazon as an integral region that defines the foundation and continuation of the Peruvian Republic? I'm thinking here about the ongoing conflicts that spill over into the 20th century and how Amazonian borders between Colombia and Peru were not defined until the 1920s and the borders between Ecuador and Peru uh, are more or less defined uh, in the early 1940s. I am also thinking about how Iquitos became a central port to control the Amazon and settle this area with Peruvian citizens. Can you tell us a bit more uh, if such considerations fit into your project? Uh, it, it, is, it is certainly correct. Uh, in fact, that is the border. The, the Peruvian borders with the Amazon historically are the most problematic borders of the nation state. And, uh, and it took a long time to resolve them and, and, and more than one wave so there is something paradoxical here that in spite of being, the borders have been so difficult to handle uh, throughout the 19th and the 20th century, I still will argue that solving the issue of the border has never been perceived as an urgent threat that needs to be solved or the nation state could disappear. And that and, it, and, and that this is also part of the local history. I think that the issue of the borders took a long time to be solved because as much as they were local interest in setting those borders, there were also local interest in not having those borders. There has always been an advantage, again, for different subjects and for different and even contradictory reasons for staying away from, from the nation state. But it's certainly one of the ironies, as he's mentioning, that being the most complicated borders, not even because of that, I could have added that to the slide, uh, that, that sense of urgency. 
Jerry, Jeremy La Rochelle uh, asks, I find the comment about how the visual representations of film of the invisible side of Amazonia, the cosmologies and the sentient landscape from which whom all inhabitants play a reciprocal role, quite interesting. In teaching courses on Amazonia, I find that including documentary films like Juan Carlos Galeano, such as The Trees Have a Mother, pairs extremely well in the classroom with Amazonian literature for helping the students to comprehend the complexity of the reciprocity between the human and the more than human that occurs there. I think some of this also has to do with how film captures the orality and the oral na narratives that are shared. If you had to choose one film to include in a course about Amazonian cultural production that would be illuminating for your students, what film would you recommend? Somebody's working on a syllabus, I think, for I'm, 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 And I'm happy that it is Jeremy. And I think Jeremy responded to a previous question as well. So thank you for that. Uh, I will choose El Grito de la Selva, which is an indigenous Bolivian film uh, about a community, two indigenous communities in, in Bolivia uh, facing extractivism by small scale extractivism and the indigenous movement well being produced and acted by indigenous. But so, so I will choose a Grito de la Selva. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're nearing uh, the end, but a lot of questions. Uh, but I don't know who this is. It's me, mi teléfono <laughs> is asking uh, what about the exploitation of oil with the development of the anthropogenic frontier in the current literature? There, there, there is a, there is a, a, a range, there are a number of novels that devoted very much to the issue of oil exploitation, talking about the Peruvian literature, Amazonian Peruvian literature in the 1980s, because in the mid 1970s, oil was discovered in the Peruvian Amazon and all the investment towards oil happened at that time. So there are a number of novels that cover oil exploitation at that time. Uh, oil exploitation, it's making its way back by the problem of contamination, the pollution of, of water. But in other literatures, oil has been part of the representation of the Amazon. In Colombian literature and in Venezuelan Amazonian literature, the representation of the impact of oil exploitation in the Amazon is there from the 30s and, and the 40s. Thank you. Um, Jorge, uh, as, we, as we start to wind down, I, I did have a question about something you mentioned at the yeah, somewhere in the middle of the talk, I, I think, um, it seems to me to be uh, uh, quite a, uh, an, an incisive view, right, into the effects of, uh, into the effects of thinking the Anthropocene from the perspective of this literature. And, and the, what you said, what I think you said, um, is that there's a sort of implicit challenge posed, right, to the nation state by the Anthropocene, but I'm assuming also by the literatures of the Anthropocene and what they articulate, right? Um, I think that the way you were talking about, uh, you know, other positionings of indigenous groups, especially in the Southern Andes, um, in, uh, in uh, literary histories, historiography of, uh, of the region, um, you pointed out that the Amazon is different, but in a sense, what you're kind of articulating is actually quite similar because if we link, right, um, uh, indigenous worldviews uh, to that which leads to a kind of critique of the Anthropocene, right, or at least of ecological disaster, then one of the things that, that we're doing is kind of lining up indigenous groups in the Amazon, right, with a sort of anti-state or anti-nation, let's say anti-nation better, actually. Um, uh, position, and that's precisely what's happened in the historiography of Andean literatures, right, uh, that we all, you know, know, know well, right, um, and in fact, I might say also perhaps in other parts of, of Latin America. Um, so, it, it, my question is more, is there a way out of that, right, in part, because it seems to me that it, it's always problematic, right, to link up indigenous worldviews or indigenous groups with, you know, a sort of anti-nation position, right? Whereas in fact, many of the things you're pointing out, you know, your insistence on the state, I mean, I think what it would indicate that in fact, indigenous peoples are not always anti, but actually quite good at working within sometimes, right? 
Um, uh, so, so um, yeah, just, just just that comment. Yes, strategically, the anti-state position always backfires for indigenous organizations. There is a moment in, in Two Worlds Collide, which is a documentary, a very interesting documentary that tells the story of El Guaguaso. There is a moment of the conflict that runs through several months in which the IDSEP said something like, if the Peruvian government is not willing to enforce their own laws, then we won't follow their laws anymore and we'll rule ourselves by our own laws. Mm -hmm. And within 24 hours, they corrected that statement and back off from, 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 from that. So uh, I think what, if only, if only because age, what I'm trying to play is, uh, let, let's also give it a chance to diplomacy. Uh, and, 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 and use all the tools that we have for better understanding uh, all the actors and all the stakeholders in this, in this process. Uh, at the same time as we can try some other things. Uh, it's not only because of age. It's, it has to do also because I'm uh, situating myself also with people that work from the perspectives of social ecological resilience. And their modus operandi is to try to reach out and develop the research project and the project and the solutions in collaboration with the actors, with the actors themselves. So I'm willing to try that uh, as well. Now, there is something very important in what you say that when we talked about Amerindian perspectivism that was developed by Viveiro de Castro when studying Amazonian, Amazonian cultures, he didn't, he didn't say Amazonian perspectivism. He said Amerindian perspectivism. So it still remains at the core of that proposal that what he elaborated with the help of Amazonian anthropology is a claim that he's making for indigenous people throughout the Americas. I don't know if that stands from an anthropological point of view, but that's what he's, where he's coming from. <laughs> So there is room here for, the, for diplomacy and, and it's a very serious issue of diplomacy. One of the, one of the conflicts here that may come up in, up in the literature is the historical conflict between the Andes and the Amazon that is recreated in oral traditions uh, it's, you know, even for Jose Maria Arguedas, the Amazon was El Reino de los Muertos. Mm -hmm. from, from the Andes perspectives, the Amazon has been the, the chunchos, has been the barbarians. Mm -hmm. And the other way around, in the other way around, there is no national confederation of indigenous people uh, at the national level in which the IDSEP has a substantial presence. They are trying to keep their, their independence. They are, specific local circumstances that justify that maybe it's not necessary the diplomacy at that level. Uh, but uh, there is diplomacy that needs to be worked out there. Maybe we don't perceive it that much in Peru, but this has become very strong in Ecuador and in Bolivia, where the perception is that the WMBB movement has been co-opted, it's, it's basically Andean, has been co-opted and co-opted by the state. In the IDCEPT website, they don't claim, there is a, a section of their page de devoted to the concept of vida plena. Close but not the same. And, and on the other hand, that section of the website is still not developed. Bueno, uh, I, for one, am very much looking forward to uh, whatever else you have to write on Las Tres Mitades de Mocho, uh, and to seeing the, uh, uh, the rest of this, uh, this project and well, really anything you write. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to that very much. Um, I uh, am, oh, I'm going to say Joe, uh, Joe Barton asked uh, if this would be made available on video and it certainly will. Um, you can email me, uh, you can be in touch with Cindy Pingree, you can do a, uh, 
a Google search for Andean cultures and histories, and you should be able to find the link in through one of those three ways. I'm, I'm very hopeful. 